My name is Danica. I'm an associate editor at Book Rise, and today I'm talking about some of the books out this week, March 9th. I had a comment that was asking how I arranged my bookshelves, so I thought I would give you an explanation of my background. That side actually isn't my books, it's my partner's. And these are my books, and I separate them into my own unique categories. So outside of frame, I have my unread lesbian fiction, and then I have unread lesbian nonfiction. Here is my lesbian pulp collection. This shelf is my red lesbian and bi woman books. And then again, outside of frame are my red non lesbian books. I tend to be really picky about the books that I actually keep after I've read them. So I have a fairly small collection of red books. And then my partner's bookcase is red and unread mixed together. It's a lot of sci fi and horror books, and they're all alphabetical by author. So if you're wondering why the books behind me don't seem to be in a coherent order, it's because they are two different systems and mine is my own custom organization. And with that I'm going to get into the new books I have for you this week. The first is How Beautiful We Were by Mbolo Mbue. Set in the fictional African village of Kosawa, it tells of a people living in fear amidst environmental degradation, which has been wrought by an American oil company. Pipeline spills have rendered farmlands infertile. Children are dying from drinking toxic water. Promises of cleanup and financial reparations are made and ignored. The country's government, led by a brave and dictator only serves its own interests. Left with few choices, the people of Kosawa decide to fight back. Their struggle will last for decades and come with a steep price. This is told from the perspective of a generation of children and the family of a girl named Thula who grows up to be a revolutionary. This novel shows how the reckless drive of profit combined with the ghost of colonialism comes up against one community's determination to hold on to ancestral land and a young woman's willingness to sacrifice everything for the sake of her people's freedom. So this is from the author of the acclaimed Behold the Dreamers. It's supposed to be a wrenching story story of a collision between an American oil company and an African village, and it's supposed to read like a contemporary fable, exploring the damage that colonialism and capitalism continues to do in many African countries. Next is a YA novel, Perfect on Paper, by Sophie Gonzalez. Darcy Phillips can give you the solutions to any of your relationship woes for a price. She uses her power for good most of the time. She cannot stand Alexander Brom, and she has maybe not the best judgment when it comes to her best friend Brooke, who is in love with someone else. She also does not appreciate being blackmailed. However, when Brom catches her in the act of collecting letters from Locker 89, that's exactly what happens. In exchange for keeping her secret, Darcy reluctantly agrees to be his dating coach, at a generous hourly rate at least. The goal is to help him win his ex-girlfriend back. Darcy has good reason to keep her identity secret. If word got out that she's behind that locker, some things she's not proud of will come to light, and there's a good chance that Brooke will never talk to her again. Okay, so all she has to do is help an entitled, bratty, annoyingly hot guy to win over a girl who's already fallen for him once. What could go wrong? So this is one I'm really excited about. I know a lot of people are comparing this to The Half of It, which is an amazing Netflix movie, but this is another take on that C. Renault tale. The author also talks about how she has written other bi-girl protagonists in the past, but never felt like she could put them in an MF relationship and was told that wasn't good by representation. So this is a novel that explores biphobia as well as the queer community. It has lots of queer characters and it interrogates that idea that bi people are only valid if they're in a relationship with someone of the same sex. Hopefully I will already have read this by the time this video goes up because I am very excited about it. Next is a romance novel, Act Your Age Eve Brown by Talia Hibbert. Eve Brown is a certified hot mess. No matter how hard she strives to do right, her life always goes hideous wrong, so she's given up trying. But when her personal brand of chaos ruins an expensive wedding, somebody had to save those doves. Her parents draw the line. It's time for Eve to grow up and prove herself, even though she's not entirely sure how. Jacob Wayne is in control, always. The bed and breakfast owner is on a mission to dominate the hospitality industry, and he expects nothing short of perfection. So when a purple-haired tornado of a woman turns up out of the blue to interview for his open chef position, he tells her the brutal truth. 
Not a chance in hell. Then she hits him with her car, apparently by accident. Now his arm is broken, his B&B is understaffed, and the dangerously unpredictable Eve is fluttering about trying to help. Before long, she's infiltrated his work, his kitchen, and even his spare bedroom. Jacob hates everything about it, or rather he should. Sunny, chaotic Eve is his natural born nemesis. But the longer these two enemies spend in close quarters, the more their animosity turns into something else. Like Eve, the heat between them is impossible to ignore, and it's melting Jacob's frosty exterior. So this is obviously a new rom-com in the Brown Sisters series, but you can read them in any order. They each have a different Brown Sister as the main character. I listened to the audiobook of the previous book in the series, Take a Hint, Danny Brown, and I loved it. I think it's my favorite romance I've ever read. It was sexy and thoughtful, and I am definitely wanting to read the other books in the series now, just on the strength of that one. If you like romance, that have that grumpy one and sunshine one dynamic, you'll definitely enjoy this. And it is also own voices autistic representation for both the main characters. Next is Can't Take That Away by Steven Salvatore. Carrie Parker dreams of being a diva and bringing the house down with song. They can hit every note of the top pop and Broadway hits. But despite their talent, emotional scars from a homophobic classmate, and their grandmother's spiraling dementia makes it harder and harder for Carrie to find their voice. Then Carrie meets Chris, a singer guitarist who makes Carrie feel seen for the first time in their life. With the rush of a promising new romantic relationship, Carrie finds the confidence to audition for the role of Elphaba, the Wicked Witch of the West, in the school's musical, setting off a chain reaction of prejudice from Carrie's tormentor and others. It's up to Carrie, Chris, and their friends to defend their rights, and they refuse to be silenced. So this features a genderqueer main character who experiences gender fluidity. Each chapter identifies whether they're using they, he, or she for that period of time. This is representation that's still really rare in mainstream publishing. It explores gender, passing, and privilege in a really nuanced way, but it also has a lot of queer trauma, bullying, and harassment, so do be prepared for that if you pick this one up. Next is a non-fiction title, The Disordered Cosmos, A Journey into Dark Matter, Space Time, and Dreams Deferred by Chanda Prescott Weinstein. From a star theoretical physicist, a journey into the world of particle physics and the cosmos, and a call for a more just practice of science. In The Disordered Cosmos, Prescott Weinstein shares her love for physics, from the standard model of particle physics and what lies beyond it, to the physics of melanin and skin, to the latest theories of dark matter, all with a new spin inspired by history, politics, and the wisdom of Star Trek. One of the leading physicists of her generation, she is also one of fewer than a hundred black American women who have earned a PhD in physics. Her vision of the cosmos is bright, buoyantly non-traditional, and grounded in black feminist tradition. She urges us to recognize how science, like most fields, is rife with sexism, racism, and other dehumanizing systems. She lays out a bold new approach to science and society that begins with the belief that we all have a fundamental right to know and enjoy the night sky. The disordered cosmos dreams into existence a world that allows everyone access to humanity's wealth of knowledge about the wonders of the universe. This is such a fascinating premise for a book. I'm also going to include in the description a link for a book trailer. It has a two-minute synopsis from the author that is fascinating and maybe the best book trailer I've ever seen. I've never been tempted to read a physics book before, but this exploration of the social issues tied up in it has definitely piqued my interest. Next is a YA fantasy title, Sweet and Bitter Magic by Adrian Tooley. Tamsin is the most powerful witch of her generation, but after committing the worst magical sin, she's exiled by the ruling coven and cursed with the inability to love. The only way she can get those feelings back, even just for a little while, is to steal love from others. Ren is a source, a rare kind of person who is made of magic, despite being unable to use it herself. Sources are required to train with the coven as soon as they discover their abilities. But Ren, the only caretaker to her ailing father, has spent her life hiding in secret. When a magical plague ravages the queendom, Ren's father falls victim. To save him, Ren proposes a bargain. If Tamsin will help her find the witch who is responsible for creating the plague, then Ren will give Tamsin her love for her father. Of course, love bargains are a tricky thing, and these two have a long, perilous journey in front of them if they don't kill each other first. So this is a sapphic YA fantasy that I am, again, so excited to read. If you like slow burn romance and unusual magic systems, then definitely pick this one up. Lastly, I have another non-fiction pick, and that's Women in 
and Other Monsters, Building a New Mythology by Jess Zimmerman. The folklore that has shaped our dominant culture is rife with frightening female creatures. Women who step out of bounds in these stories, who are angry or greedy or ambitious, who are overtly sexual or not sexy enough, they aren't just outside of the norm. They're unnatural, monstrous. But maybe the traits we've been told make us dangerous or undesirable are actually our greatest strengths. Through fresh analysis of 11 female monsters, including Medusa, the Harpies, the Furies, and the Sphinx, Jess Zimmerman takes us on a feminist journey through mythology, teaching readers to embrace a new image of the female hero, one that looks a lot like the monster, with the agency and power to match. After seeing where compliance gets us, harassed, shut out, and ruled by predators, women have never been more ready to become repellent, fearsome, and ravenous. So this is a cultural analysis of female monsters from Greek mythology. I am always on board for monstrous feminism. This reminds me too a bit of when queer people reclaim gay-coded villains. The characters that are meant to be the monster can often be the most inspirational and interesting. And I have a bonus recommendation just based on the title and cover alone, Magic Mutant Nightmare Girl by Erin Grammer. I mean, if that alone isn't enough to sell you, nothing I can say is going to make you pick it up, so. There you go. Those are all the books that I have for you today. Let me know in the comments which one you're the most interested in and if I missed any that you're excited about that come out this week. If you have watched all the way to the end, please leave me a snake emoji for Medusa in the comments. It helps to feed the algorithm and also my own ego, so I really appreciate it. And until next time, happy reading!